Good afternoon and welcome. This session is entitled Cloud Foundry, The Gaps. And my name's John Weatherall. I'm an architect, a cloud architect at BNY Bank of New York Mellon. And um, a little bit of background, kind of what brought me to this, basically what brought me to this talk. So uh, I've had a, year, uh, a career in develop, software development and delivery. Uh, the last four years I spent it at Active State building our Cloud Foundry based PaaS, helping build it and, and basically deliver it. Uh, the PaaS called Staccato. And it was a really interesting role. And I, from the viewpoint of a Cloud Foundry vendor, visiting a lot of large enterprises around the, around the world, around the country anyway, and seeing what their problems that they were facing were, you know, seeing the problems they were encountering, trying to successfully and rapidly deliver software. And, um, and, and the barriers that they were seeing, and, and not just in general software delivery, and then with, plat with the platforms they're looking at, including Cloud Foundry and including Staccato. So I had this uh, viewpoint of seeing all these companies from the viewpoint of an external vendor and getting a lot of you know, very informative descriptions of the problems that they're facing. And uh, I've since moved on from the Staccato project, and I joined BNY Mellon six months ago uh, working on the PaaS team. And it's now like I get to see the world from like the other end of the telescope. So instead of from the external, you know, long distance view of a vendor, I'm now seeing it from the inside. And first of all, it's, it's affirming a lot of what I've discovered over the last four years talking to these big enterprises. Yeah, they get these same exact problems. And, uh, but what it also is doing is really from the external, I, I didn't really see the depth and the, 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 how difficult some of these problems were to solve. And now I'm, <clears throat> I'm seeing it firsthand from the inside. And uh, so um, what this talk is about, or what we're going to focus on, is um, our work with Cloud Foundry at BNY Mellon. We're a gold sponsor of, of Cloud Foundry, the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, we have brought it into our, our shop. And, uh, so the work with that, and, and uh, it's basically framing this with, we have been building a PaaS for several years, for almost 15 years, and um, so how that relates to the Cloud Foundry and everything that we're doing. So that's kind of a background. Uh, as far as BNY Mellon goes, we're, we've been around for a long, long time, one of the oldest established co companies in the uh, banks in the country. And we handle massive, massive amounts of of you know funds and finances and currency, etc. Um, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed to say that before I started interviewing with this company, I hadn't really heard of them, um, and yet it's actually it's a very um, uh, important financial institution institution in the world, as you can see with these numbers: 29.1 trillion in assets under custody, one point you know, lots of money, lots of assets going around. We have 13,000 people in IT. And as I mentioned earlier, we've been uh, working hard on cloud software. Uh, we, we, we've been building a PaaS for 15 years. We've been building microservices long before microservices were kind of the latest trend. Uh, we're a Java shop mostly for the most part. So we've been working hard on all this stuff. And uh, we have built our own PaaS. Is this working? No. Oh, I see, it's a build. I didn't realize that, pardon me. I'll let this cycle through because I don't need it to do the build thing. So we have this platform called the Nexon platform, which is our platform for soft cloud software delivery, including the, the PaaS itself, including analytics and, and digital information. I think I just blew past this thing. Uh, my apologies. Okay, let's try this. I overclicked it. And uh, this platform itself, we've been working on it for several years, and um, we're on the third generation of it now. It has had profound impact on our ability to deliver software. And uh, I'm just very carefully stepping through the slides so I don't go too far. And um, it's, it's the entire platform for our whole software delivery system. And we have incorporated Cloud Foundry as basically as a POC and an evaluation into this PaaS, as we'll see shortly. So <clears throat> I didn't realize that they had provided me as, these as builds. It's here. Okay. 
But the point of this slide here, and we'll get into the meat of this thing shortly, the point of this slide here is to show how we have advanced over the years from our ability to provision and deliver software taking a long period of time to a much shorter period of time. So back in the old days, it would take two to four weeks for setup and for the same amount of four to 12 weeks for testing and QA, 12 to 16, four to 16 weeks to get things out into production. And um, that's part of the dev cycle. And we've got most of that down to a single day. So, and that's the, um, <clears throat> the speed up that you can expect when we're moving into the modern era. But there's some incredible challenges we have as a bank to try to get there. And that's some part of what I'd like to cover um, today. So yeah, let's move right into that. So th this, is, this is huge. And by the way, when I was visiting all these companies all over, you know, a lot of them were banks and financial institutions. And I, I swore to myself I'd never work there because of all these restrictions that they have imposed on them. And um, I found that working, looking at BNY Mellon, they're, they're aware of a lot of these constraints and these, these challenges, but they're actively getting past them. And that's what we'll look at here. So it's a, a huge financial industry um, company in, in a very highly regulated in industry. We have massive amounts of transactions going through our system, very high volume, very high amount, high number of transactions. And um, to the point where if, if something fails, it could potentially affect the economy of the country, right? It's that much. So obviously high availability is absolutely essential for our operations. We have multiple data centers across the planet. They need, to be, they need to stay up. We need to understand disaster recovery. Obviously, security is very important. And we've been around for a long time. We have a lot of old, cold, old code, old applications, legacy apps, you know, vintage apps, as they said this morning, and more, more modern stuff that we have to deal with, have to work with. Different hardware architectures, software architectures, all the things you would expect integration with vendors and partners, all these things are, are huge challenges. And just a little bit about the regulations. Audits are huge. Everything that we do has to be audited. I'm trying to just paint a contrast here between what it's like at this financial institution versus at a, um, you know, a startup that's working with, with logs or data or something like that. These, cons these constraints have significant effect. So having everything has to be auditable and trackable and secret delivery and secret management has to be very carefully controlled and never getting in the wrong hands. Um, every step of every process has to be reproducible precisely as it was pre reproduced. So every image that's built, every artifact that's built has to be tracked and reproduced. Obviously fraud detect detection. Many of these things are, are, they have huge impact on how we are able to deliver software. Here's one example, is separation of duties. By regulation, um, the uh, coders must not deploy to production. So if you're a coder, you can't deploy. If you're a deployer, you can't code. There's that strict separation, which you know, um, kind of gets in a way, a little ways of the DevOps concept, right? But, by, but this is by regulation. And, and that fact, that one little fact, has significant impact on our whole de development life cycle, including on our paths that we've built. So I'll, I'm going to skip through some of these because I don't have a lot of time. I want to make sure I get into the, the Cloud Foundry part. But some of the additional challenges, just the massive amounts of, of data we have running through. We are global. We have to be up 24 by 7. We have SLAs to deal with all over the place. We just can't be down. And I do want to say a little bit about DR. So without a doubt, Bank of New York Mellon understands disaster recovery. We've been through some, basically the worst possible thing you can happen, have happened to a data center. We have had happen to a data center about 15 years ago, and we had to deal with that. So there's many people that I work with that are experts at what DR really means and how we can recover from it. So there's a lot of things that, that has to be incorporated into our entire platform at all times. You have to keep, keep on top of that. We also have to validate this. So we have to prove to the regulatory, uh, regulatory bodies that we can recover from a disaster. And it's kind of interesting. Um, it turns out it's easier to go through a, a real DR event than it is to test for a DR event. Because if you have to test for a DR event, you actually have to keep all your existing stuff going and then gradually move it over to, a, you know, somehow move it over to another data center. Whereas uh, 
with a real DR event, you don't have to worry about, you know, gradually bleeding off processes or things like that. It just, it's down, it's gone, right? So we have to prove that periodically and uh, make sure we can simulate failure, failover accurately. Uh, there's a lot of stuff regarding security, but again, I'm sensitive of time. So let's, let's talk about some of the challenges. Um, the, uh, and as a company, we're doing all the things that you hear about at a conference like this, microservices, and we are, we are doing DevOps to the ability that we can based on the, the regulations. Containerization, Docker, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, all the things, we, we are heavily into open source Open source makes a lot of sense for a, no, a number of reasons, and we're very sensitive about getting locked into a specific solution or a specific vendor. But uh, there, yeah, many advantages of open, open source, and we're, we're actively taking advantage of, of all the open source, or many of the open source projects that you've heard of, including Cloud Foundry. So some of the strategies we follow to try to get here, um, PaaS itself, as I say, we've been building a PaaS for all these years, and uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that and how it relates to Cloud Foundry. So Cloud Foundry, we, as, I say, we're, as I said, we're a gold member of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. And we have incorporated Cloud Foundry into our PaaS. Again, we're using the open source version. We're taking advantage of a lot of its features for monitoring and log aggregation and the self-service on-demand cloud stuff you would expect to, give, to allow our developers to rapidly provision um, an application. Auto scaling, all the stuff you come to expect with Cloud Foundry. Um, another valuable point is its a hybrid cloud ability to support hybrid clouds quite easily. Okay, so let's get into the meat of this. That was kind of the background. I think I've got 20 minutes left. So um, there's a lot of uh, gaps that we found. Uh, there's several gaps we have found with Cloud Foundry that we've had to work around or, or had to meet, and um, I'm going to cover these relatively briefly. I want to set, set the stage, though, that this, this is not a defects of Cloud Foundry talk by any stretch. There's no way that any product or application could meet any, everybody's needs at all times. And uh, as I say, we've been building paths for 15 years, and we have all our specific requirements, and we're, we do things the way we do them, so we can't just drop in and you know, replace all our stuff with a brand new technology and have it work. And so what we've done is we spent a lot of time analyzing and evaluating what Cloud Foundry does and how it fits into our existing platform. And what I'm going to cover in, in this talk, in the remainder of this talk, is some of the gaps between Cloud Foundry and our paths and how we've filled them up. So, and there's, I think there's three slides here with some of the high-level gaps, and I'll blast through those while I, I dive into each one in just a little bit of detail. First of all is OS cer certification. So a lot of our products must be by, by regulations, they must run on certain specific operating systems. And um, so we found bringing in Cloud Foundry, that was a little bit of a challenge because it wasn't certified to run on some of these OSs. So we don't have a choice about this. We have specific apps that must run on specific OSs. And then as an organization, we certify a set, a, a fairly small set of OSs we can use internally. So that was a definitely a constraint we have to work around, and I'll get around shortly how that, how that happens. Um, I mentioned disaster recovery, and um, I realize Cloud Foundry is making great strides in all of these areas, by the way. Um, this is our kind of how we've been in the last few months looking at things as they were. But having a, a use case for Cloud Foundry, sorry, a use case for disaster recovery that can handle an instant loss of a data center and, and failing over to a secondary data center, um, we have to have a, a very precise way to describe that and make it happen. And obviously the, the whole multi-data multi -data center operation has to be very seamless. So it's like, um, if you've maybe heard of Ubernetes, it's like the Uber Kubernetes thing. You kind of need something like that with our paths. And we've built that with our paths and that's, we're, Cloud Foundry is sliding, sliding into that. So we need a single control plane so we can manage all the pieces of this, whether it's the applications or the services, across multiple availability zones, across multiple data centers, across multiple clouds for that matter, even uh, private versus public cloud. And um, another challenge of that is there's all this vendor integration. So we use vendor products for monitoring and for logging and for load balancing and all these other, other 
facets of, of the paths. And we have to integrate with all of this. And it's no mean feat to take care of all that. Network and application issues, I guess. Um, so that basically there has to be ways to describe how different app instances and services and containers, if you will, can communicate to each other or cannot communicate to others. So I want to make sure that this uh, web tier, you know, uh, Ruby on Rails thingamajig can talk to this Java tier but can't talk to this database tier. Uh, that's just a very trivial example, but it gets much more interesting when you have, you know, fleets of microservices operating throughout your network. How to control the access between all these different components? Or for that matter, how to enable it? How can I get from here to here? So um, there's a lot of complexity involved in isolating, isolating networks. And then we have this whole ecosystem where, um, for us, oh, sorry, containers, the, the con whole container concept. So Docker is, you know, obviously um, Cloud Foundry is actively working with supporting Docker, um, which is really cool. And we, we were able to use that to great use a few months ago, but there's some limitations that we found that we, we had to overcome. Uh, for example, um, I, I don't know if it's changed yet, but when, when we were on it a couple of months ago, it was very difficult to have Cloud Foundry pull a Docker image. You, this is with Dago, obviously. To pull a Docker image from some random, like let's say, internal secure registry, as opposed to having to go out to the Docker, uh, to the hub. So that, that was a challenge that we, we had trouble getting past. Um, or taking a, an existing container that has requirements for volumes and figuring out how to get that to work inside of Cloud Foundry as a Docker container inside of Diego. Um, a lot of challenges we, we had trying to get, get past that. Mike. Check. Oh, good. Uh, and Docker has some nice features like uh, Docker Compose, the ability to describe multiple components of an application in a single descriptor and deploy the whole thing as one unit, which is, which is pretty nice. So we have our own uh, version of that. We've had it for years. We have our own descriptors that describe apps. I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, so these are some of the things that the Docker and the containerization support that we had to work around or, or had to deal with. Uh, a little bit about build packs. So very powerful concept. You can take any arbitrary app and Cloud Foundry will understand it and provision a container for you based on, on what your application is built from. But um, we found that, so very powerful, but then if we needed to customize it at all, we had to you know, download this build pack code, which is several thousand lines of Ruby code. And we're, we're a Java shop, so suddenly we have to have a Ruby expertise on board to understand what is inside this build pack and how to maintain it. And then issues like, can we contribute that upstream, our changes, is it, is it relevant, things like that. So it, um, the build pack issue was just, it was, I'm still struggling, I'd love to, to talk to people about how, how you get around that issue of build packs complexity and the, the massive code base to deal with it. Um, what, what I've done in the past is just taken a, um, uh, you know, if I need to do something really simple like Java and Tomcat and some specific customization, like injecting some security thing, um, you almost can just bypass the whole build pack or the Java build pack and use a bash script, like 20 lines of bash to do the same thing. But I don't know if that's the recommended way. Anyway, um, another thing, uh, so a lot of uh, work is being done today for the, you know, the TCP router, et cetera, uh, allowing uh, non-HTTP and non-HTTPS traffic to be routed through Cloud Foundry. Um, and you know, back in the Staccato days when I was with Staccato, we, we'd been working on that for a few years now. It's been working quite well. But with, uh, with this latest venture, that was a limitation where we want to make sure I c we can deploy any workload, whether it's HTTP or not, and have it correctly routed to by the paths. And you know, ideally, um, our paths should support UDP as well. And um, I'm not sure what the status, I, I haven't checked recently of, the, uh, of whether the TCP router is, if there's also a UDP router underway, but um, our PaaS is having to deal with that outside of Cloud Foundry. Okay, um, assemblies is pretty interesting. So I need to be able to take, um, uh, to describe a, a complex application topology with a single descriptor. And again, if you've used Docker, so Docker Compose is a really good example where you can have a multi-tier app or a microservices-based app with multiple components, multiple services that it makes up and describe them in a descriptor and then use Docker Compose to provision the whole thing as a single entity. And these partitions for us, they can include all sorts of things, whether it's vendor software or 
standard 12-factor applications and services or a lot of our legacy apps, um, cron jobs, services that need to be up all the time. All this stuff needs to be uh, wired together, described and wired together, and, and we use assemblies for that. So 12-factor apps, you know, Cloud Foundry is really good at that, good at that and, but that, that's kind of the, uh, the easy part. 12-factor apps, they're stateless and they, they have standard ways to log and configuration and source code manager, all that stuff. But we have all these other applications, all these, you can call them legacy apps, but not necessarily legacy, they're just not cloud native applications, I guess. And uh, all of these apps need all this stuff, the automation and, and versioning and um, scaling up and scaling down. We need to be able to do that effectively for any category of application, not just a web-based app or a 12-factor uh, uh, 12 application. So um, what we need is to be able to manage this from a single abstraction. And we have what we call an assembly, which is like a Docker Compose file, which describes all the components of this application in a single place, and then we can provision it this entire thing as a single entity. Um, things like dependency management, um, how can I get the latest version, make sure it's the latest version of a service is tied to, to a specific application. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that is, uh, you know, microservices has great promise, obviously, ability to version your, all your services independently. Um, but on certain applications with, with, with very high requirements of, of availability where, you know, there's penalties incurred if, you're, if your app is down for a minute, lots of money, penalties involved, um, it's maybe a little too risky just to allow that microservice to evolve on its own, right? Um, and so instead you have to be able to say, well, this application requires this microservice version X, Y, Z, I was going to say Z, I should say Z since I'm in this country. <laughs> uh, I want to be able to tie each application to specific versions of everything. And that's what an assembly can be used for. It's say, this is my entire co complex application and I, I can deploy it as a unit, I can version it as a unit, I can roll it back as a unit. So that's uh, something that we, we have had to build outside of, the, of Cloud Foundry and we've, that's what we've been doing for several years. Um, another thing we need to look at is, is like affinity or location awareness. Um, so if we have, you know, for, for many workloads and applications, you need to have the data and the processing close together. And Hadoop is a good example of that. But uh, the ability to, to, I don't know, partition your, all your resources so that certain workloads get targeted at those resources. Um, hot, cold storage. So I might have this, you know, petabytes of storage that has very, very long time to access it, and then I have my smaller memory pool, which is instant access. And I need to be able to say, you go over there and you go over there. And we, we um, need to be able to use our paths to say all this stuff, so specify all these, all these constraints. Same with specialized hardware, G GPUs and FPGAs, etc. Our paths needs to be able to, to handle all this stuff. Um, shared local file system, again, I understand this is coming with Cloud Foundry, um, if it's not already here. Um, but many of the apps that we do deploy, we need to have the ability to share multiple, multiple instances of the app running across the paths need to be able to share a file system easily. And we need to be able to specify this in the descriptor or the assembly descriptor. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, single sign-on authentication, so we have just huge infrastructure in place to deal with this. And it says here lots of customers. It means there's lots of people within and outside of BNY Mellon that will be authenticating to our systems. And the PaaS is what's deploying these systems. So it has to have some understanding of an integration with all these different authentication mechanisms. So very complex. And, and there's some that are very challenging to do. So we have to do a lot of work on that. Um, yeah, third parties, customers. Our whole stack, whether it's ancient hardware or brand new software and hardware, has to be able to, to deal with all this. Okay, secrets is an interesting topic as well. How's my time? Oof. Okay. Um, <clears throat> secret management is regulated. And I've been at um, companies in the past, and I'm sure there's many, many companies, but where as a, if I was a clever and malicious developer, I could easily get into a database and look at things or even change things if I knew what I was doing. I've, I've been there. And, um, you know, there's, there's ways to get around that, but we have to be just very precise on how we control secrets and making sure that secrets don't get in ever, can never possibly get into the wrong hands. 
So developers and deployers just can never have an access, access to a secret that provides access to some trusted or, or needing to be trusted resource, some sensitive resource, okay? Um, exposing secrets via the environment is, uh, is kind of risky. So we're looking at sophisticated secrets management techniques to get past that. And just to say a little bit about trust, um, you know, it's, it, might be, it might seem to be a good thing to trust our developers, you know, trust developers in general. But in fact, that's not a good thing, and it's nothing about the developers. Um, myself, as a developer, I do not want to be burdened with the trust of secrets. I never want to have a secret, because if I have that secret and something happens, you know, suddenly I'm kind of, I'm in, I'm in there somehow. Whereas if I never had that secret, never even came close to it, that I can do all my work. So the PaaS has to be able to allow me to provision everything I need to and run everything I need to, but without me ever getting my hands on that secret, any, por any portion of the whole SDLC. And so we have to very care carefully bake that into our PaaS. It's just a fundamental uh, tenet for the PaaS. Okay, so that's a few of the gaps with Cloud Foundry, but as I said, this isn't a Cloud Foundry bashing talk by any stretch. Um, there's a lot of really good things about Cloud Foundry, and I'll just wrap up my talk by just covering these in briefly, and, it, and I'm sure many of the talks here cover all of this stuff too, but it's a very strong community, as is evidenced by this, by this conference and by how things have been going for the last three or four years here. Um, and we are using the open source Cloud Foundry, which gives us a lot of power, as, as you can imagine. Really good for 12-factor apps, really good for microservices, really helped us with our hybrid cloud initiatives. So we can take our apps and have them deployed across multiple clouds, both internal and external, you know, Azure, AWS, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the same point here. It did allow us to do some POCs with Docker. There was, as I said, there were some limitations, but we were able to really quickly provision Docker containers into our paths using our Cloud Foundry uh, integration. Um, many of the developers in-house that used, Cloud, used our paths that had the Cloud Foundry in, incorporation were we're just pleased, to put it mildly, of how simple it is to provision apps when, when you have Cloud Foundry taking care of all the heavy lifting. The service broker, uh, Cloud Foundry service broker, whole infrastructure, we've been using that. Um, URL provisioning is really nice. If, you know, the wildcard DNS, wild, uh, Cloud Foundry URL mechanisms, um, it's really nice to, for a developer to provision an app and that URL is instantly available. Um, that's a huge thing. The logging. <coughs> Um, this is standard Cloud Foundry pitch, which I'm really good at, by the way. I've done it for many years. But um, the logging, the polymorphism, ability to um, uh, support multiple languages, uh, the security groups it has for isolating workloads and, and basically creating networks between, between, or partitioning networks between workloads. Um, the open source one, we had no vendor lock-in, and we had, we had cloud. So, yeah, no specific IS tie-ins, really, as far as from the, uh, from the higher level. And it really helped with the separation of concerns, who does what. I'm out of time, so I'm rushing a little bit. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of things that Cloud Foundry did very well for us. Um, but we are continuing to use our existing paths because we have built it to support all these things I discussed at the beginning of this talk. Cloud Foundry is a paths component, so when you push an app to our paths, it might, in certain circumstances, will push that, we'll just pass it through to Cloud Foundry. Um, but, you know, so it would be a single Cloud Foundry instance running across these data centers as opposed to uh, kind of an Uber thing. That's where our paths comes in. But it does very well with the things it does. It does Cloud Foundry deals with all the things it, it's good at very well, obviously. And uh, we are able to leverage that. Did I have a... Yeah. So, greatly simplified app deployment. Um, the descriptors are simp much simpler as well. So, our app descriptors, if we use Cloud Foundry for certain classes of apps, we can simplify the descriptors and, and the specification of those. Much faster to bring a developer on board to figure out how to provision an app to the paths to the cloud. Um, the URL provisioning I mentioned, Docker, POC. You know, we can do some Docker work with, uh, with Diego and the hybrid cloud. So, that's kind of the... Uh, the, the front of my talk. I don't have time for questions, unfortunately. I will take just a second to say that um, we have a bunch of innovation centers around the globe doing some very innovative things, and we are hiring, and it's a very cool place to work, so <laughs> I just I wanted to put that in there. Um, if you're interested, in, go to this URL or come talk to me. It's an incredible 
uh, the, the um, initiative to innovate is coming from the top and from across the organization. We're doing some incredible things. I'll plug, uh, we are, there's a panel discussion at 4.55 today, uh, 4, 4.50 I guess, um, in Ballroom B and it's finance and cloud basically is what we're going to talk. We've got half a dozen people or so to discuss finance and cloud, so come to that. And that's my talk. Thank you for the time. <laughs>